the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. Fun Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. One story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Support for On Story comes from Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth generation farmers and third generation winemakers based in Clarksburg, California. Makers of sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of their family values since 1968. Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Damien creator and showrunner behind The Walking Dead, Glenn Mazzara. I never took into account the audience is going to like this, the audience is going to object to this. You know, you, know you, can, you can't be fearful of off the fans because that can become paralyzing. The fans want it to be good. So if you can deliver a good episode, they will follow that. This week's On Story, writer and showrunner Glenn Mazzara discusses his journey through the television industry and how having multiple roles in television has developed his versatility as a storyteller. Curious, have you always considered yourself a storyteller or a writer? Um, and, and when did you start? finding that as maybe not just your passion, but something you wanted to do for your whole life? I always wanted to be a storyteller. Uh, like, I wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. And I remember when it started was, you know, my first day at school. I came home and my um, mom said, what happened at school? You know, how was school? And I was like, oh, it was fine. And so she goes, well, you know, your older brother and sister always tell me what happened. So then I proceeded to tell her exactly what happened. Like, I walked over to the desk. I didn't know what I was doing. You left. I was crying. And after about an hour and a half, she goes, you really have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I don't know why my mom would say that to a five-year-old, a six-year-old. But she was like, you got to get to the highlights. You have to learn how to tell a story. And my mom was a good storyteller. So I was like, oh, okay. She's your then, first manager. Yeah, she was my first agent. Yeah, exactly. Because it was crime your first passion or what was what did you enjoy writing at first i did grow up watching sydney lamette movies like you know kind of new york city in the 70s I, I like that kind of style so and and if you look at my stuff it's always very kind of grounded and visceral and very street but when i went on to nash bridges i did i have a brother who's a re, who was nypd at the time he's retired so i did kind of gravitate toward cop shows you know and i did a lot of research I was writing my own stuff. I brought that onto The Shield. Let's talk about you breaking in and then breaking in in general. Nash Bridges was your first show. So when I was working at the hospital, I was just a pain in the ass. And I just kept asking people, hey, do you know anyone in Hollywood? Does your cousin know anyone in Hollywood? And I would like literally cold call people. And they would be like, who, what? How'd you get this number? I did that for like four <laughs> years. And they would, and you had very nice assistants who would say, can you call back in six months? I would call back in six months. They would go, really? Like, I just did not take no. So I finally connected with a manager, okay? And this manager uh, read my ER, um, um, read my homicide, and he sent them over to an agent, okay? A guy at Gersh. And because they had wanted to have a client together. So they called me and said, you know, well, listen, the ER is kind of a gimme because you work in an ER. Can you write something else? So I used to write my scripts. I worked at NYU Medical Center at that time. So I used to go down to the library and write my scripts there. And right in the East Village, they had just opened up New York's first Krispy Kreme. 
So I got on a sugar high and I rode a Buffy in like 18 hours, okay? I drank like two liters of Coke and a box of Krispy Kreme. And you can write a real nonsensical Buffy if you're, if you're Jack like that. So, so they read that and they were like, wow, that's a banana script, okay. Uh, so I came out, I met these guys and they said, you know, why don't you come out for a staffing season? I was like, what staffing season? So I came out for staffing season, I rented this ant filled apartment. It was terrible. And, and, um, within three weeks I got a meeting at Nash Bridges. Okay. They had read the script or whatever. So I got this, this pitch meeting at Nash Bridges. So I go in and there's three guys in the room. One is the showrunner is Carlton Cues. Okay. Carlton then ran lost and, and, um, Carlton's kind of like a tall guy with a booming voice and he's sitting against the window. There's a window behind them, and the sun's going down. So he's just a silhouette, okay? He's just like a scary voice, you know, <laughs> like, like when 2020 does, like, the drug dealer. You know, it looks like that. And then, and then John Worth, who ended up running Hell on Wheels and a number of shows, he was his number two. And Sean Ryan, who created The Shield, he's, he's on a couch, and he's wearing, like, a hockey jersey and shorts, right? <laughs> uh -huh. And... I'm coming from New York. I think it's like a New York job interview. So I'm wearing a black suit and tie. <laughs> That's what you wear to a job interview, yeah, right? Yeah. So they thought I was from business affairs or something. <laughs> and I sit down and they say, you're like, what, what, uh, okay. So they're thrown by me. <laughs> I'm thrown by them. It's not a good fit right away. And Carlton goes, what do you have? And um, I go, well, I have this old cage that Nash up on and they go well, okay well nash doesn't screw up he's he's don johnson he's the smartest man in the world what else do you have and i had papers and i was like oh yeah sure i got something else but i had one story like worked all the way through i didn't have pitches so i started going um yeah sure i got some other stuff and i'm rattling my paper and stuff and i start having a panic attack mm -hmm. so i start I can't catch my breath. I start sweating through the suit. Oh, no. and, and finally, Carlton goes, are you okay? <laughs> Should we call 911? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. And so he goes, can we get him some water? Can we do something? So they take me into another room, and I lie down. Someone opens my tie. I felt like someone opened my pants, but that's not true. But anyway, so and they, <laughs> they put ice behind my neck. Oh my and God. they're like, yeah. And they're like, kid, you were just trying so hard. I just felt like a fraud. <laughs> I felt like I had been wasting everybody time it was a disaster so so John Worth actually was like listen it's TV you just and he pulls a book off his shelf that is like uh, you know all the plots from I Love Lucy and he goes you just watch old TV shows and rip them off <laughs> and I, was, <laughs> and I, was so, I was so disappointed in that I was like don't say that I want to be an artist so I um, came back and I sold him an idea and, and I was hired to, you know, staff. So let's talk about The Shield. That was one of the first prestige dramas that like really, it seemed like kind of rocked how people saw crime dramas working and how cable could really lead the way. Um, did it feel like a groundbreaking thing at the time? I had read the script for The Shield. I met Michael Chiklis on the day he was shooting that famous, you know, you know, good cop, bad cop, mm -hmm. went home for the day. You know, I'm a different kind of cop. So so I met him that day he was shooting that. I'm like, this is bananas. <laughs> They're never going to, you know, pick this up. And um, and Sean said, you know, listen, I think you'd be great on this show. You know, I'll hire you if it gets picked up. I just remember thinking, like, I'm screwed. So he kept his word. I was the first writer he hired. And he actually called me and said they just picked up the show. And he actually said, I have to hire real writers first. So come to my house tomorrow and kind of work off the books <laughs> for the Homie Break episode two, and then we'll get you a contract. So I don't know what that meant, but anyway, yeah. I was hired onto that show. At the time, though, you know, people feel that The Shield came out and was a big splash. It wasn't. It, it premiered very well, okay? It premiered like four million, which... They thought they were going to get 400,000. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, people were interested. But critics did not like The Shield mm. because The Shield aired in March um, 2002 after 9 11. And all cops were heroes back then. So to create a show that was actually more relevant now, 
talking about police corruption, police brutality. You know, I've watched a few episodes recently, and, and the minute someone does something wrong, other cops say, we got to cover this up. That's part of the conversation now. Back then, it was wrong of us to do that. That's what people... So LAPD uh, refused to cover our sets. At the time... It was it was kind of like a, a, a dirty show, and then you know when Emmy nominations, Michael was won his Emmy, but year after year we were shut out of a lot of awards like that. You know, it was all about HBO, it was all about The Sopranos. It was all you know. I mean, they would review The Sopranos and The Shield together in Entertainment Weekly and say like, this is a good show. And there's other shows out there too. You could check that out. You know, like, you know, it was all about Six Feet Under. It was not about The Shield. So it's only after The Shield really stuck the landing with a, a very good finale, a series finale, that I think The Shield holds up and has kind of joined that place on that, sh on that shelf with some of those other prestige dramas. But at the time, um, we were kind of like the ugly stepchild. I, I, that's how it felt like working on that show year after year. Looking back at The Shield now, especially the first season, are there moments or scenes or characters or anything like that that you're particularly proud of? There's a scene in uh, my first episode on The Shield in which they kidnap a basketball player, you know, and Shane is getting unraveled and Shane and it kind of escalates and suddenly Shane pulls a gun and, and Vic... Uh, pushes him into the next room and goes, what are you going to do? You're going to execute the guy? And he goes, I I isn't that what we do? We kill the cop. Drag your lily white ass back home to see me valley. Get out of Hollywood, you mother <laughs> Christ, what's the matter with you? What? The guy resisted. Resisted what? I asked you to babysit him. Well, somebody needs to teach him a lesson. By doing what? Executing him? Well, why not? I mean, isn't that what we do now? I told you. That's over. We killed a cop. And so now this guy's trauma and, and what we thought was a funny storyline is really he can't deal with the trauma of the crime that they committed two episodes ago. And that became a seminal fixture of the Shane character after that scene. What I'm proud about is we did not discuss that scene. That was not broken in the room. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in the moment writing that scene. And, I, and suddenly I was just there and I saw it in my head and Vic pushed him into another room. And there was no other room. We had never discussed it. There was no other room in, in the outline or whatever. And then I wrote that scene. And I, I think it's the best scene I've ever written, you know, because it was just, it surprised me. It was just really honest. It was it was right there. Walton only has one line in the pilot. Mm. And there were other actors like Kenny Johnson who have no lines because we just didn't have enough room to fit everybody in. And so then suddenly we were like, oh, it's not just about Vic. It's about the strike team. We can go to Walton. Walton's a tremendous actor. You know, I love Walton. And Sean, as a showrunner, took from Carlton, you can feel the energy breaking. You know, like it doesn't have to be you know, oh, I'm the showrunner, it's all in my head. You can say, oh, this is where the show is going. The, show, the uh, artistic material reveals itself to the artist sometimes. And when you have a group artistry, you can start to say, oh, we're going in that direction. Follow that, you know, follow that writer to that actor, to that thing. That's the show. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm very, very proud of that scene. You've been watching On Showrunning, a conversation with Glenn Mazzara, on On Story. Want to see On Story live? Yes! Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers Conference each October. What the f is that? That is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival. Ooh, ooh, I want to go too because you keep saying how good this movie is. I want to get to The Walking Dead because sure. obviously this is one of the biggest things you've done and yeah. has a crazy following. Can you talk about, because I, I, you wrote an episode before you became showrunner on season one. Is that right? I wasn't available to staff mm. on season one because I was doing another show and I wasn't, and the dates didn't work. But they said, would you write a freelance episode? I was happy with that script. 
And so Frank Darabont, we were meeting and he was giving me notes and he was asking me a lot of questions. He was having difficulty running the show. Mm. It's very hard to learn how to become a showrunner, okay? And one of the things that Frank, I think, challenged Frank was, you know, he was used to doing a movie over two years. Now you're doing so many times that in much shorter amount of time. So he was asking me show running questions. Oh, yeah. So, and I really liked that show and I really liked Frank. So then he asked me after season one aired and they got picked up for season two, he asked if I would come over and be his number two. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people advised me that that was a step back. Hmm. I had already been a show creator. I had been a show runner. Now I was going to be, um, you know, number two. But like I said, I like Frank. I really like the show. And I thought, okay, you know what? Let me figure out what I want to do next. So I'm going to step back and, you know, it'll be great. They'll never fire Frank Darabont. I can just kind of be on his staff and that'll be a nice gig. Well, they fired Frank Darabont <laughs> and, and I became the showrunner and, yeah. and had to face those challenges. That must be intimidating. What was that process like in taking it over in that changing of the guard? I kind of imagine there's some sort of like stepdad thing where people are like, that's not how Frank did it. I do remember there was a uh, conversation I had where I was meeting with the post team, the post production team. And one of the editors asked me, um, well, so, so I guess they're not happy with Darabont's cinematic vision for the show. So they brought you in as the TV guy and now we're just a TV show. Is that correct? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> so what was great about that conversation was it pushed me to develop. So I was like, well, why is Frank cinematic? Mm. So I looked at his shots. I looked at, at his type of story. And Frank is a master, a world-class director. Let's go. So I studied that. You know, and I, I started to look at, oh, here's, because on The Shield, it was just, you know, documentarian style filmmaking. The Walking Dead did need to be cinematic. So that question kind of forced me to look at how do I use filmmaking? And I think it changed me a lot. I think it changed my writing. I'm very thankful for that experience because it really made me kind of go back and say, well, what am I doing this? Why, why am I, you know gonna do Walking Dead. What kind of pressures were you under with that level of, of a hit on your hand? You can't be fearful of off the fans, yeah. okay? Because that can become paralyzing. Mm -hmm. The fans want it to be good, okay? They want it to be good. So if you can deliver a good episode, they will follow that. One of the things that you have to be careful about is once you finish the process and you put it out there, you cannot control what happens to your material. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it it's, it's just has its own energy and the world will either respond to it or it's not. So you kind of have to enjoy the process. And so with the process, I really always kind of made sure that we were trying to showcase our, right, our, our characters, find stories that put those characters together in interesting ways, you know? Um, um, I really loved the idea of, uh, you know, one of the things, I am a, a zombie film fan, and at that time, I would say there were really only 20 zombie films that you had to study. And zombie films have a lot of the same kind of stuff. So now we could kind of think about, and I got this from Nash Bridges, what haven't we seen? Mm -hmm. You know, you know. So there's there's a scene, for example, in which um, the governor of uh, Merle and the governor capture Glenn and Maggie, mm -hmm. right? And they're questioning Glenn, "Where's your camp?" All righty. I want to imagine how I felt fighting my way off that roof. One hand, <laughs> losing blood. Walkers are chomping down at me every step of the way. Last chance, where's your group? Uh, suit yourself. You're a pretty big snack for this fella. But you know what they say, 
He's gonna be hungry again in an hour! Go! Grab boy! Okay, so Glenn's tied to a chair, and they're slapping him around, right? How many times have we seen that scene and where someone's in a warehouse and they're being slapped around, tell us what we want to know or we're going to beat you up, right? Yeah. How many have you, times have you seen that scene with a zombie? Never. So I was like, bingo, we got it. Because <laughs> I would just go get a zombie and say, tell me what a, where your camp is. And now how does Glenn fight his way out of that chair and kill a zombie while he's... I've never seen a person kill a zombie because they can't because they're tied to a chair. Yeah. So, so we could kind of follow our characters and then just add the magic sauce of zombie and we had a good time. So I'm curious, were Thank there you. characters that you... Um, were gravitating more towards when you took over, ones that you were like pushing to have, have bigger roles or to, to, to ch more challenges? It, 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 two things. One is, this I've spoken about and the other one I've never spoken about. So let's, let's go into the first one, the easy one first. Okay. One of the things is when I took over um, Walking Dead, it was a lot of checking in with the characters, okay? And, and we were losing focus on Rick. Mm. And I remember even watching um, an episode with my son, who was very young at the time, and he said, Dad, who's the star of the show? Okay, and so if you look at the beginning of season two, Rick is, um, he's kind of lost in the shuffle. He's, he's, he's passive, he's not doing anything. When I took over, I was like, I need to make Rick the thing, because Shane was overshadowing him. Yeah. And, and it was becoming Shane's show, but if Rick is weak, if Shane ends up going against Shane's already a strong character, so, so for him to go against a weak character is not that interesting. So we get to this incident where, you know, the Sophia is, is really a zombie. She's in the barn, and Rick steps forward, and he everyone's horrified, and Rick steps forward, and he shoots the girl in the head. Well, when we met Rick, the first time we saw him in the pilot, he shoots a little girl in the head, a little zombie girl. So, so that's not fresh for me to do that. I'm kind of hitting our greatest hits. Even though it has a lot of emotional impact here, it didn't really work. And, and that script had been conceived under Darabont, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but Darabont did not polish that script, okay? Okay, so I polished that script. So now the next script is called Nebraska, and there's a... Herschel is, is upset. He goes into town. He goes to get some alcohol. Glenn and Rick follow him. And as they're talking to him and the, the Walking Dead was crowded with existential um, um, speeches about are we going to be OK? So we were kind of trying to burn off one there. And, and um, three, uh, a couple guys walk in. It's literally some guys walk into a bar. You got to understand, we can't stay out there. You know what it's like. Yeah, I do. But the farm is too crowded as is. I'm sorry. You'll have to keep looking. Keep looking? What do you suggest we do that? I don't know. I hear Nebraska's nice. And these guys are asking questions, and you start to feel they're threatening, and they're going to kill these guys and go back and take that safe farm. Right. Now, Rick is a cop, and he's dealt with drunks in bars before. So I've got, I've got him on stage, and Rick ends up, you know, the guy moves. Rick's faster. It's classic Western showdown. <laughs> Nebraska. This guy. And in one scene, I had Rick as the star of the show again. In one scene, that comes from Nash Bridges, that comes from all of that. So I was able to correct the, the show or make a correction that I felt the show needed. The other thing that I, I did on that show that I felt I, I had a lot was the Carol and Daryl connection. I felt that they were both outsiders. I felt that they were both lower class and he wanted to find Sophia, okay? That was giving him purpose. So I remember, you know, we kind of had them dancing around each other or whatever. And then there was a scene in which after the barn burns down, like everything burns down, you know, the whole mm -hmm. thing, 
she's running from a zombie and he goes up and she gets on his motorcycle and they drive off. He's literally a knight in shining armor saving her, okay? <laughs> the barn burns down, we go to commercial and they come driving through the fog. And AMC was like, please cut that driving scene. And I was like, no, we need to know they're okay. If they're okay, everyone's okay. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and so it was kind of putting them together. And then I wrote a scene for them in the season three premiere where they were, they were talking on top of the, the bus or whatever. And I kind of always felt like there was magic for those two to be together. That was something I felt I pushed in the writer's room because I just felt those characters needed to, to be together. You've been watching On Show Running, a conversation with Glenn Mazzara on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. Want to be in the know on the latest On Story episode? Be sure to subscribe to the Austin Film Festival's YouTube channel below and follow us on our social media at AFF On Story.